Well, hello, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, and welcome to the Game Maker's Guide. This is your host, Tyson, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today with uh, two of the three founders of Soft Chaos, a big uh, board game making. Uh, do you guys prefer, like, uh, think of yourselves as a company or li like creative enterprise? Like, like what kind of denomination do you give yourselves? So, so we're a co-op uh, and we make all sorts of interactive experiences. So uh, sometimes that means like tabletop games. Sometimes that means like interactive theater, sometimes video games, all, all sorts of just interactive stuff where players get to like make choices and participate uh, actively. With, uh, with that being the case, uh, let, let's uh, what is it, introduce the two thirds we have with us today. Uh, the doctor is in. Uh, we have uh, a one Jess Marcotte or Jesse Marcotte uh, and then the other member we have with us uh, that we're very thankful to have would be D. Squinkifer here with Hello. us. And uh, we are sending love to the third member, Allison. Uh, what is it? Sadly, uh, they were not able to attend today, but uh, very happy to have the two of you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, happy to be here. So just want to start off with, uh, what is it? W with, with a simple question, not philosophical at all. Uh, what pull attracted you both to game making? Like what, what was it that really got you into, uh, into designing games and into the field itself? Yeah, so I decided I wanted to design games when I was about 10 years old and never stopped. Um, oh, actually, like it started a little bit earlier than that. Um, like um, when I was maybe like, eight or so I designed some logic puzzles um, and drew little cartoons um, to uh, to match up with them um, and then uh, but then like I started making video games um, like when when I was 10 I learned how to program in basic um, and yeah just never stopped <laughs> wow that that that's amazing just just went straight what now now, has video games always been kind of like your your heart and home, or was it easy to, what is it, transition into more like board game interactive? Yeah, so um, yeah, like video games are definitely where I have the most experience working. Um, but uh, yeah, at some point in uh, maybe like within the last 10 years, 10, five, 10 years or so, um, like, I uh, wanted to, uh, like, I don't know, I wanted to bring humanity back into my design, like, into my design practice. Um, so I started teaming up with uh, people making, like, tabletop and LARP stuff, and it's been fun. That's fantastic. And, uh, uh, as for me, uh, I, I'm a storyteller by training originally. But partway through my master's degree, I was doing like some journalism. And one of my first assignments was at Global Game Jam. And I sort of like accidentally joined a team. And then from there, there are always, Montreal's a really great place to be making games. There are always like, luckily, like a next opportunity to make something. Like a lot of really supportive programs, uh, like the Pixels Incubator. Uh, or I, I did like a, a small games incubator called Critical Hit. Uh, and so there's always like a, a next step and a next step. So I just sort of also never stopped. It was like, well, let's, let's make games for as long as I'm able to, uh, to afford to. And then all of a sudden I was studying games and designing experimental games and like getting a doctorate in games. And uh, yeah, uh, I, but I would say that like, I, I always played games, uh, you know, and I played a lot of tabletop games, was a game master for, for a long, long time before I started to make games, ooh, but like almost nine years ago now. Now you say you're a storyteller by training, but like was your focus initially in, German, in journalism? Uh, creative writing uh, and, mm -hmm. and English lit and uh, communications, arts, media, and theater. Um, but the, the journalism gig was sort of like a, like a little research assistantship with a, uh, game studies lab. 
and they mm-hmm. wanted someone to cover different events that they were having and you know run social media accounts and then it was like oh i guess i make games now like how did you guys figure out a name as dope as soft chaos uh, <laughs> and, and what and what was really the the inspiration of like coming together like oh this is this is something that we can really build and really make into something special so so i think like to start with um when squeaky and i started to collaborate closely we were really interested in vulnerability and uh, this idea of radical softness, which is like kind of like in a world that really wants you to like be tough and like grow a thick skin and like, you know, uh, like toughen up to, to be soft and like caring and vulnerable is kind of a radical act. And then simultaneously, I was also making games about like things like consent and uh, that sort of stuff with Allison. And then um, we had the chance to collaborate like all three of us together in different configurations over the years until finally we were like, we, we like each other. We like working together. We make cool stuff together. Um, what can we do to sustain that? And what, what can we do to also unfortunately protect ourselves in an industry that can be really uh exploitative so uh for for workers and so we we thought that a a cooperative structure sort of put us in charge of our own work um would help us like enshrine good working practices anti-crunch practices into into our work um but yeah so like we that that's where the softness comes from i think uh, and also a bit of like how we formed up as a co-op. For the chaos part, I think that's like, hmm, how would I put it? We we are playful. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we take our work really seriously. Uh, and I think I think it's like it encompasses a, like a lot of different ways that we work. Um, the diversity of projects that we take on um that that sort of thing too squinky what would you say about chaos and softness i think we want to stir up shit uh, (laughs) personally (laughs) (laughs) we're really like adorable and cuddly and yet we want to uh like we want to make smashy smash um to existing uh existing capitalist structures and uh, and oppressions. I often find that like places and like co-ops and what whatever they're in through the naming process never really gets to the heart of it. But I I can really appreciate you guys like really taking like like what it is on the like the fulcrum of what you want your co-op to be and making sure that people know that right out of the gate. Um, and I and I also did want to talk about um, radical softness because when I like I was looking through your guys's uh, website. And like, I saw kind of like the thesis statement of focusing on radical softness, community connection, awkwardness and vulnerability. And I was curious, like, like what, what, when you were starting the co-op, how did that like thesis really come to a head? Like what, like, what was it that really drew you to these subjects to explore? Squinky, do you want to go first or should I? You can go ahead. So I think sort of uh, something that I've learned over time is to like stop fighting my impulses to try and like fit someone else's box. And so this, this was the kind of work that we were already making, like I think consciously, but also just like what, what drew us. And so we have a, like a long history together, but the co-op is kind of new. So Mm -hmm. we were already making like this, these awkward things, these vulnerable things, these queer things. Uh, and so I think, I think it sort of flows naturally out of the work that we were doing before, uh, and the projects we were taking on before. Um, so like those, those themes just sort of seem to come up continuously for us. So instead of like, um, you know, denying them, like we, we embrace. Yeah. And like, uh, to add to that, um, uh, there is a lot of like, um, it's like, all of us uh, at Soft Chaos are queer, um, and uh, Jess and I are both trans, um, and uh, like we have some like neurodivergence in there. So like all of these things that make us like 
outside of the norm um, and kind of like in the process of uh, like understanding ourselves, we have had to be awkward and vulnerable. And um, those are experiences that uh, we really want to represent in our work and uh, connect with others who have uh, experienced similar things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that no, that's beautiful. I'm, I am so happy that you guys are here to really to really offer that to the greater the big, bigger board like gaming community, I suppose you could say. Um, now, I also wanted to focus on the games that, at least the ones I was able to find, please clarify, let, let, sorry, not clarify. Uh, let me know if I'm missing any of the games that have gone public as of thus far. Uh, Strangers on the Net, I, I've seen as the most recent one that's, that's come out. Uh, Denial and Yearning, and This is Fine. Uh, so I, I suppose uh, to, to Squinky, uh, in your words, wanting to stir up shit, uh, I, I can see that I can see that thesis really in this is fine. I suppose I'm curious where where that lingers for like strangers on the net and for denial and yearning. We're like, uh, oh, I, I suppose we should. Pro well, I should probably have you guys introduce what exactly these games are. That's that would be a very a very <laughs> strong way to start this. Um, so, how would you describe the your games that have come out thus far? So um, Strangers on the Net is uh, basically a Discord LARP uh, where you play as a teenager in 1999 who uh, loves two things, uh, a, uh, a particular fandom, um, which you decide on during the game. And examples include Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Sailor Moon, Pokemon, but it can be whatever the players want and agree upon. And the other thing that uh, that you love is uh, hanging out on like an IRC like chat room um, with uh, and uh, playing as characters uh, from your favorite fandom with your friends um, who are strangers on the net. Uh, so sort of, you know, this this idea that maybe has changed a lot uh, as people become more online and certainly <laughs> more maybe more comfortable with the idea of doing things online like you know buying things with your credit card or online dating but like before that I think there was a lot of anxiety around like who the people on the other end of the screen might be uh and we we wanted to explore that and we we all three of us like had experience as being those teens on the net uh and looking back on that uh yeah I guess just sort of like realizing how how much like that time shaped us also how like what kinds of hot takes we had at the time um and like how we we changed since or because of those interactions uh this is fine uh it, an apocalyptic networking event uh is a slightly too prophetic uh LARP that we designed uh, or live action role-playing game that we designed uh, for the 2019 Golden Cobra competition, which is a short LARP competition. Uh, and in this game, uh, the apocalypse is going on around you, uh, but you still need to like smile, network, and get, get a job because you need to like survive under capitalism. Um, a little too real, maybe, these days, uh, but uh, so in this game, it, it's three rounds, and the each each round the apocalypse worsens. But you need to, you know, impress the very important business entrepreneur to to get that gig. Uh, and denial and yearning is uh, a project headed up by Allison uh, with a team of guest artists. And in that game, uh, you basically write and role play a trashy lesbian romance novel. Uh, it's the best. Gwinky and I got to play test it together and we, uh, we, we designed a, a book called An Arc Through the Ages and it's Joan of Arc time travels to the 90s and meets a used book slash record store salesperson and they fall in love. Uh, <laughs> for example, <laughs> but you can design anything that you want uh and so that's that's a really lovely project that uh just finished kickstarting 
Uh, it's also available online right now, and we are planning to have some physical copies at, well, online TCAF this year. Uh, and we're also releasing a few projects for uh, TCAF, so the Toronto Comic Arts Festival, uh, to, to sort of showcase uh, some, some other older work that we're proud of, uh, work we've done with collaborators that hasn't seen like a, like a wide release uh, in this, this sort of zine format instead. I, I just have so many questions for like, for all of those, because oh, those all just sounds so good. Um, <laughs> So I, I suppose I, I, I do want to ask, is, is the Joan of Arc, like I, I know that was just something like, like that you two were working on together just like as per playing it, like it, is it possibly anywhere, anywhere we can see it? L like whether it be in comic format, just anything, because oh, like, we, we have a cover, <laughs> we have a, like a fake, fake cover for it. Uh, and we have like a fan art cover of it that one of my friends made <laughs> afterwards after hearing about the the idea <laughs> yes. oh, um, that... the, uh, the cover art uh, we spent a bit too much time on the cover art which is to say jess spent a bit too much time on the cover art but totally <laughs> worth it it was beautiful <laughs> oh my god that sounds amazing oh oh i i don't have words i don't have words okay what, so what more do you need right <laughs> like yeah it's like <sighs> I, I want a 300 page novel of just strictly just that plot line. <laughs> oh goodness, where was my brain going? Uh, oh yes, so for, for Strangers on the Net, I, I am very curious, like exploring the, like the entire concept of like, like essentially the time frame and the difference to where like technology and where some people's comfort like lies today like what like what was it that you individually discovered both within yourself and also through other people playing or play testing like was there anything that really struck you as interesting that you weren't expecting uh anything like that I, I think the first thing that strikes me is that um as as we were so we did it like a number of like uh theater runs with it so far we're working on releasing the full rule set <laughs> And as we did it, I was also sort of living it. So like um, realizing that like actually, you know, like like one by one, uh, my my different friends from that era uh, like came out as trans or queer or, you know, like just, or, or even so a little bit of a spoiler here, uh, but in the, the, second, the second part of the game uh, takes place 20 years after the first part. So you have like, the first half of the game where you're all like teens uh, and then like you you come together later on uh, as as adults uh, in the frame of the game uh, to sort of like give your server a send off because it's like finally shutting down. Uh, so it's like all of, all of the drama, all of the like little fights that you had, the the romances, the those interactions, you get to like revisit them uh, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was, I was experiencing that like with, with, with these friends, like as I played the game, I was like, oh, well, maybe I should look this other person up or like, maybe I should like see how they're doing. So it was a, it was a strange experience. Uh, I would say that like just how like vulnerable and meaningful and like beautiful it was for almost every run through, like the way, the way that it connected people and the way that it connected them to themselves and to like, literal strangers that they had never met before uh, was just amazing to watch. It was so wonderful. Um, what, what were your impressions, Squinky? Because we, we, there's a lot of games where like we were f facilitating different games. Uh, so we, we weren't together. Yeah. So like um, over the summer, um, like I ran a couple of like Harry Potter themed games and that was really like at the t at the time we were like just starting to find out um JK Rowling's turf leanings mm. and mm. At the time, like, I thought it was a good idea to go with this anyway and maybe, like, explore the relationship that uh, queer and trans fans, like, fans of Harry Potter have maybe been, like, uh, it's like, 
dealing dealing with this whole like tension between like uh, this uh, this series they loved and that like has some like some themes that uh like that a lot of uh, like trans people related to strongly um mm-hmm. but then have to uh reconcile that with um like actually like this uh, this this was written by somebody who like is who like now even uh, even later is uh like explicitly like explicitly got the uh, the turf beliefs now and mm-hmm. um and i guess like after a certain point like instead of like wanting to explore that dynamic and i think the players really like the players really enjoyed that especially like um the uh, the the trans players um mm-hmm. in the game were like found it uh, found it really cathartic but mm-hmm. then i guess like later later on in the year when um like jk rowling came out publicly with a whole letter and everything um mm-hmm. like it's like okay i i don't feel comfortable running games in this universe anymore mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. at a certain point you like have to draw a line um so mm-hmm. that was um like yeah that was that was kind of the bummer thing that I dealt with um mm-hmm. in uh, in this game um yeah like basically yeah dealing with uh, dealing with disappointment from uh, like it's like somebody you thought was speaking to you but mm-hmm. actually actually wasn't in the end um and mm-hmm. how heartbreaking that can be um mm-hmm. and uh, and also like it has to do with um I guess like the audience of uh, of players in particular um and like really being careful to uh, to frame expectations in that regard yeah no i, I no i'm i'm n- now i'm just like sitting and just thinking about it there's just a lot there but like the like you said the the act of being uh, of thinking you're being spoken to and then it turns out not so for for, for this is fine um into like the moment i i read like oh it was an apocalyptic like business meeting like i I made it was like sold check mark this is my (laughs) shit um i like was there anything like like, i suppose in develop in developing that in uh that games like a little bit more specifically uh, of course we have like a very real version of it currently that that we're all that everyone is dealing with but I suppose I I was curious like where where the I suppose with 2019 like where like where the tongue in cheek kind of like inspiration came from it. I I think unfortunately um, there there was a sense that this was kind of already the case in 2019, but we were mm-hmm. like, well, it's not like you know like the literal apocalypse. But then, Mm -hmm. like, murder hornets happened? Anyway, like, (laughs) I think at the time we were like, you know, this is already in some ways, like, the the lived reality of of a lot of people. It's like, there are things we would rather not do, but Mm -hmm. we need to, we need to survive, right? So we need Mm -hmm. to, uh, like, accept certain, I think, indignities or accept or, like, pretend that, like, certain things are normal uh, or acceptable uh, when they aren't really, and I think that's what we were trying to get at. Um, but, but yeah, like the like it, it was. I think it was like meant to be uh, a bit sardonic or like a bit dark humor, like like yeah, like dark humoristic, uh, in the sense that uh, this these these experiences were already real. Uh, mm-hmm. we wanted to make fun of them but we also wanted to acknowledge them so it was sort of like mm-hmm. oh like this is this is too real so we have to joke about it because otherwise mm-hmm. like you know we will give in to the existential dread of what it is like to like live this situation uh, mm-hmm. what do you what do you feel about it Squinky? Well, um, a couple of things come to mind. Um, like, uh, so around the time we, uh, like, um, we made This Is Fine, um, 
it was like when uh, there were a lot of climate protests going on. Um, mm -hmm. So that was uh, pretty much in the in the front of our minds. Um, mm -hmm. like, yes, environmental devastation uh, caused by neoliberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like, and also earlier that year, um, I had quit my PhD, mm -hmm. um, which uh, was like a very hard thing for me to deal with. So I was kind of uh, in this uh, in this career limbo, um, mm -hmm. and uh, like just feeling incredibly pessimistic um, about uh, like any possible like job prospects, uh, like. Mm -hmm. I gave academia a shot and it didn't work out the way I expected. And the reason mm -hmm. I went into academia in the first place was because I gave um, industry work a shot and that didn't pan out as expected. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So like eventually um, now, now we're here like in the process of formalizing this worker co-op, which um, mm -hmm. like I'm really excited about it. But it also, in a big way, feels like a last ditch, uh, like solution to just dealing with like so many, like so many bad work situations um, mm -hmm. that I've been in, and that we've all been in to an extent. Um, mm -hmm. Like, and all of these like expectations on us to uh, to like produce and just work on things that are just so comparatively unimportant um, compared to the uh, like the the global catastrophes that we're facing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of feelings of alienation uh, from like from our own labor uh, and also from like our ability to like have some kind of control over our environment uh, and like yeah, the, the global situation um, for, for sure. Like that makes, that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, what is it? So, something that I, I suppose like, like a connection that kind of just like finally sparked inside my head was the talking about earlier about like, like what exactly the, the thesis to soft chaos is and like making sure like bringing like like the like uh i suppose the uh, i don't know if this is an actual word radicalness i suppose you could say uh and really in enveloping it into the games as a way uh, as i will always adore from this interview fuck shit up um or sorry start shit not fuck shit up that's my own that's my we own bad also that also that <laughs> <laughs> More, more um, swear words is always good. Yeah. I mean, it always feels better. It feels better. Um, and, and I suppose, I, like, I was just thinking about, like, like uh, the games that you guys have developed that we've we've spoken about, and kind of just like the the concept of like protest through games, and like like really making a statement that I I, I can see like that is definitely threaded through your guys's work. Like it's the stitching that is definitely holding things together. And I suppose I was just curious, like what ass, like, like what is your guys's like perception of that, of like protests through games and like, what's your methodology? So like, I think about um, a lot of, uh, like a lot of our work is in many ways a response to um, like the uh, like mainstream commercial game industry um, mm -hmm. and like video games in particular, but like also board games, also tabletop games um, mm -hmm. and that stuff. Like, like there is definitely this, um, this undercurrent in, uh, in geek culture of uh, like this very uh, like misogynistic um, and like almost mm -hmm. and like in, in many respects, outright fascist. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, like, yeah, we had uh, like, we've had, we've had huge harassment campaigns that uh, like eventually like grew into what the alt-right is now mm -hmm. um, and has become and uh, like, 
all of this like all of this horrific geopolitical stuff that happened like um and and like came out of uh like and came out in many ways of this whole like in video games um and the way that they've uh, they've been marketed especially like since uh, like since the 90s like specifically like marketing experiences as uh, as power of uh, these fantasies of power and control um mm -hmm. especially like in a world where like so many people don't feel as though they have uh, power and control in their uh, in their lives uh so like video games um and other games become this uh, this space where like a lot of um, like partic particularly white men um, and uh, like and I guess uh, ad and adjacent demographics being sold this uh, like sort of uh, this this power fantasy um, and so there is like this like political undercurrent that already exists within games and as like as game developers like i like i definitely see us and we d and i think i can like uh and i think uh, the others would agree that we are sort of an antithesis to this um we are like make we are creating this sort of political disruption um within uh, like within our medium as artists mm -hmm. um like def like um I guess like defying, um, like defying the uh, like dominant politics of uh, most mainstream games, but also like sort of defying uh, these rigid borders in terms of what form they take. So our work is also like very permeable. Like it's like, is this a is this a video game or is this a board game? Um, like there there are some. Uh, it's like there are some elements of uh, of all sorts of things. Is is this theater? Is this uh, like, is this a uh, is this like conceptual art? Who knows? And uh, like, and that's really like part of the fun for us. Um, so I think like uh, yeah, like I definitely think that uh, that political work of any kind, like if you're not having fun, then it's not uh, like. Yeah, it's like like why why bother if you're not having fun? I mean, it's really serious too, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you gotta be having fun. Mm -hmm. So this this reminds me of I think like uh, one of my favorite uh, memes around video games, and I I teach sometimes, so I I often show this to my students, which is uh, the like video game protagonist bingo card, like like who like who are our protagonists in games, and like who. Like, you know, it's like, oh, it's like, it's it's a great card. Like if you just Google like video game protagonist bingo card or search it, it's, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, but yeah, so like, you know, there's like a typical assumed audience, uh, like in, in marketing in games, even though like statistically, we know that that's actually not the case that like, you know, uh, who these marketers think they're marketing games at and who the demographics actually are are totally different, but they still like, there's still this very, like a, a very slow change, but also like a, a refusal to change, uh, possibly because like Squinky was mentioning, there are unfortunately these like very targeted harassment campaigns against anything that's perceived as like, you know, uh, like a diversity initiative or like taking away something from gamer folk who have strong opinions about who should be making games and what games are for and who they're for. Uh, they're very loud, right? And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the loudest voices are the ones that get paid attention to. So yeah, even, even though there are so many folks that are interested in like entirely different experiences who think that games, you know, like we, we ascribe so much power to explore all sorts of different themes to other mediums like you know books and movies and theater uh but we were like video games though they're just for fun like you know mm. you can't you can't actually like talk about anything critical or serious with a game of course not like you know mm -hmm. uh just like uh, so uh we we know that's not actually the case but i think that's like a very strong perception 
Uh, and it's, it's very common for marketing to be like, you know, we got to appeal to our main demographic, uh, mm -hmm. which I think mm -hmm. is a big, it's very constraining. And I think it affects what kinds of games get made. And I, the, the thing that I'm most excited to do is through this co-op uh, and through, you know, um, fucking shit up uh, is <laughs> to explore like what we can make when we're not concerned about those things. When we put those things aside, like what can games be? And it turns out that like, there's a whole lot of weird and fascinating and engaging things that, that games can do. And we're like slowly discovering that. But I think the people who are, are making that work are often folks at the margins or like very small teams uh, who are taking these risks. And then mm -hmm. later on, larger companies sort of reap the benefits of like the, the, the small folk uh, taking those risks first. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're interested in, in being playful, um, but also critical. Uh, so that's, that's sort of like, that's where I think the soft chaos comes in too, is like mm -hmm. this, but also that, like these two, mm -hmm. like, like seemingly maybe, um, like di dissonant or like things, things that don't quite seem like they go together and like putting them together and see what, seeing what happens. Like, you know, um, and I think, I think the humor and fun that Squinky was talking about alongside the very serious topics is part of what helps us access the vulnerability uh, that mm -hmm. we're, we're interested in. So sort of mm -hmm. like a, a disarming, both like in terms of helping people to let down their guards so that they can have a cool experience, but also mm -hmm. literally like, you know, in the way that like, people seem to want us to think that video games have to be all about like guns and power fantasies and like mm -hmm. being in control, uh, like a disarming in that sense too, like t taking away the guns and then seeing what happens. So to, to I, we, well, I've been asking some big questions the, the last little bit. So gonna pull it, pull it back a little bit, just something a bit more fun. Uh, like what, what games are you guys excited for? like coming out in the future or games that you've played recently and you're like oh they they're not getting enough attention essentially any kind of like signal boost you want to offer anything at all um i'm excited about um Zalavie nelson's um an airport run by dogs for aliens or whatever that <laughs> title is uh, like dog airport game uh, <laughs> and uh like uh it is just like one of the most delightful things I have seen in a while. <laughs> and I am like really excited for that to come out. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think there's just, there's like so, so much that I'm excited for. I think like one, one that I'm really excited for is uh, Goodbye Volcano High uh, by, by Co-op Mode who are also about to become soon, hopefully a games co-op uh, in more than just name. Uh, I, this is a game where like it's, um, you are dinosaurs, but also high school students. Uh, <laughs> it's like the art, the art is beautiful. Um, and, and like, you know, it's like kind of like <laughs> right before the asteroid from what I understand. Mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. and uh boyfriend dungeon uh i don't know how much attention boyfriend dungeon is getting i feel like it got a lot of attention for a while but uh mm -hmm. it's a combination of a like dating sim and like a dungeon crawler game where you date oh, your weapons cool. that your weapons have like notifications <laughs> and you level them up by like making friends with them and like getting to know them better and like forging a bond uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, also like full disclosure i did some consulting for boyfriend dungeon <laughs> <laughs> oh that sounds amazing <laughs> oh my god i okay i need to look that up immediately after after this um so uh with wrapping up i do just want to was it off of you guys like where can people find you where can where can they either find uh like websites tw twitter facebook anything you want to offer uh so twitter is a good spot to keep in touch with us and like there are also links from there that i think are, are easy to find 
So a good little <laughs> link tree, I guess. Uh, we're soft underscore chaos uh, mm-hmm. on Twitter. Uh, and our website is softchaos.games. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're all on Twitter. Uh, we, we have a, an itch.io page as well uh, at like softchaos.itch.io. Well, dot itch dot io. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and look out for us, I think, at TCAF. We are going to have some very exciting projects. I'm currently working on some watercolor art, and we can get we can get Ty's honest reaction. Uh, let me pick one. Okay. Uh, so I'm doing some watercolor art for a game called Awkward Times at Moonbeam Market uh, for a little zine. And oh, how can oh. I make you see this? Oh, I see. I have to I turn see. off turn off my virtual background, uh, uh, <laughs> so I can show you uh, Chow Chowder. So this is a recipe oh. where a Chow Chow dog oh. must witness you make make the chowder. <laughs> chowder. <laughs> It it know it knows so much. <laughs> oh, that's perf. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Oh, oh man, that's exciting. Okay, well, uh, what is it? I want to thank you both so much for coming on to th- onto the show with me and uh, discussing everything. And uh, once again, uh, we are sending Allison all of our our love uh, from here at the Game Maker's Guide. And uh, thank you both so much. Thanks for the chat. Thanks for having us. Thank you.